Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today, we welcome back John Apino. He's the CEO of Contract Diagnostics. Today's Kevin MD article is Navigating Stipend Offers, a Residence Question. John, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me, sir. Always, always, uh, always fun to be. All right. So John's been on multiple times, of course, talking about all things contract related to to clinicians. What's this latest one about navigating stipend offers? Yeah, we had a question uh, that came through one of our our national discussions, our national educational event that we did, and and uh, we thought other people might benefit from it. So we wrote and uh, published something on it, and it was about stipend plans. And uh, I, I, I the I think the verbiage can be can be taken in different ways by different people, but stipend in this situation was a physician asking, should I sign a contract early to receive a stipend? And this is, you know, mid-2020, uh, mid to late 2024, Q3, and he was looking at signing a contract for 2026. So looking at signing out, you know, 18 months, 20 months in advance, and he was thinking, is this in my best interest? There's a stipend that they're offering me. And how should I look at the stipend? How should I navigate this process? And was just looking for some general advice. So just to be clear, to sign that contract, committing him to a job 18 months in the future, that job would give him a stipend mm-hmm. in order to commit that early. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. So it's a benefit. Having a stipend plan is a benefit to many people. So the organization, maybe they have a physician retiring and they know that they've given, they've had uh, plenty of notice. So they want to replace that physician. Maybe they just know that they're going to be busy and they want to have appropriate physicians on staff for 20, 24, even 30 months down the road. Maybe there are certain specialties that are hard to recruit. Maybe they've got predictions and projections on volumes coming up for whatever reason. A lot of employers like to lock in physicians early and they like to know what their staffing models look like ahead of time. I think We've all seen the model of the physician supply and demand curves over the next, you know, 30 years, and they don't look good for a lot of employers. So they're finding how can we, you know, fill our roles easily, quickly, and if we can predict the future and, you know, and uh, protect our time, that's that's a good thing. And a lot of physicians are thinking, you know, maybe they maybe they know where they want to go. Maybe they're from a certain part of the country. They know that they want to be in Chicago or they want to be in the Midwest or they want to be on the beach somewhere. Southern California, for example, and they know, why, why am I going to wait? I, I, I like this employer. They reached out to me. They're willing to offer me the stipend plan, and I'll go ahead and sign. So again, it can be a win-win for a lot of people, but it can also turn out bad in some situations. And in cases like this particular question, was it a physician in the last year of residency or last year of fellowship? Yeah, it was a it was a orthopedic surgeon that was going to go do a couple of um, extra training years and was looking at signing up early. And I believe this one they were offering him four thousand dollars per month for the next I don't know if it was twelve months or fourteen months or sixteen or eighteen months, but they were going to offer him money while he's training. And you know I don't know what the current salaries are for residents and fellows these days, but. I know $4,000 can move the needle quite a bit. And so it's a benefit to him and his family. I believe that he had two or three kids and, you know, rent or a mortgage, one of the two, and having $4,000 extra per month was going to be a big win to him and his family. And he thought, if I'm going to take the job anyways, I might as well take a little bit extra money during my training. So in terms of that stipend plan, so $4,000 a month for 14 months, as long as, of course, he follows through and takes a job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they provide this, they provide the income to him. Uh, if you want to call it a, an advance on a, a, you know, a lot of them do have signing bonuses as well. They still offer repayment on loans. They still offer relocation. They still offer a healthy salary, but they offer this to him every single month as a, a benefit to signing out early. Of course, if the physician doesn't show up, they owe that money back with right. interest most often. And then that's kind of where the crutch is. So it can be a wonderful thing for a physician and his or her family. But if they don't show up for work or maybe they get a better offer, and believe it or not, Kevin, we do have a lot of, and I would say a lot, but we have a more than we expect physicians who go through our process, they sign a contract and they call us back in three months, four months, six months, and they say, I've got a better offer. How do I get out of the one that I already signed? 
And so it's one of those things where there's a lot of risk that goes into these things. And, you know, there's, I mean, I could bring up another point of risk. Maybe you sign the contract and it says you'll, you'll have a stipend of 4,000 per month for the next 12 months or 18 months. Then when you start, you'll get an extra $50,000 signing bonus or starting bonus. Plus we'll repay for your relocation amount and we'll give you a salary at let's just say 400,000 with an RVU rate of 61 per each. So everything's set, you know, got a contract. It's got everything in there from, from a, a maybe a restrictive covenant to tail insurance, to a start date, to, you know, all the requirements of the schedule and call obligations. It's no different than any other physician who might be starting in three or four months, but the contract is locking in a lot of those salary figures as well. So if this specialty, for example, 400,000 might be the median at that time. And if they lock in at 400 with an RV rate of 61, and when they start working, they start, you know, maybe that's that final year of training, that final four months or six months of training, they start getting offers for 430, mm -hmm. for 440, for 450 at 66 in RVU or 72 in RVU. It can be quite painful to show up uh, for your job at 400 and $61 mm -hmm. per RVU, knowing that, that the place down the street maybe pays quite a bit more. And depending on the opportunity, you may be locked into a restrictive covenant or a non-compete. And again, depending on if you leave that position after your stipend is paid off, you may have tail insurance to buy. So lots of things can factor into these stipends agreements that, you know, that, that are more in the future that a lot of physicians need to think through before they just think $4,000 a month, mm -hmm. man, that could benefit my family. So tell us, in fact, those specific questions that physicians need to ask themselves in order to consider the stipend plan. How did you advise this particular physician? Yeah, well, one, number one, we always tell them, if you know what this is where you want to be, if you know this is a group that you could work with, then we think it could be a wonderful thing for you and your family. We advise the physicians to know how the taxes work. Do they get the $4,000 or do they get $4,000 less taxes? Of course, they need to know what happens if something comes up between now and when they're scheduled to show up for work. Or if they don't work for the one year, two years, three years, or four, that's required in the agreement. It's important to understand the repayment provisions. Maybe there's something that's, that, that, that is unfortunate, like a death or a disability. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to make a decision to not show up, right? And there's consequences to that decision. But sometimes, you know, life is cruel. And in the in, in, in its issue of a, of a death or a disability, you know, or maybe even the first couple of years, a for-cause termination by the physician or a no-cause termination by the employer, um, those things are out of the physician's control. We would like to hope and expect that that dollar would not be needing to be repaid. It's also important to know, again, what the salary figure looks like. And I, we do advise our clients that they should insert something into the contract that says, or market rates. And of course, mm -hmm. we always encourage our physicians to have lots of robust conversations with the employer about, you know, how do you set compensation? How does it change over time? What if it changes between now and when I start? And hopefully they say, well, you know, we just peg it to the 50th percentile, or we always start our physicians at the 30th percentile, or we start all physicians at the same. I would ask them the question, what if you're starting physicians at a different number when, when I show up? Will my compensation be adjusted? Of course, we'd like to say adjusted only upwards, never downwards. But I think most employers would say we rarely decrease physician compensation, at least, you know, at least on the surface, they might have other ways that they would do it. But we would have those things inserted into the contract as well. So I think it can be a wonderful thing to a physician and his or her family. I just think it's important to make sure that you understand all the risks behind it and what happens if, if things don't work out the way everybody expects. And in terms of the type of jobs that typically offer a stipend, are we talking about hospital-based systems, academic medical centers, yeah. specialists, primary care? What type of typical jobs are typically offered stipends? No, great question. We see this for hospital employed positions. You know, we don't see it for academics. You know, if there's a private practice involved, it might be with a layover of a recruitment agreement and, a, and an income subsidy from a hospital system. But most often it's just with a hospital system itself looking to hire. And again, it just depends on what their needs are right now. I mean, yeah, you can search what the what the highest needs are. I mean, mm -hmm. cardiothoracic surgery is a huge need right now. Urology is the oldest practicing specialty. So if you look at the projected retirement patterns of urologists right now, any urologist coming out of training in the next four years, five years, could probably sign a contract right now for pretty good money and have a lot of negotiating capital in the interim. Primary care, of course, is always being recruited and hired. And you know, it does vary by location a little bit. We see less of a need maybe to hire 18 months or 24 months or longer out in mm -hmm. some metropolitan areas that are more highly sought after. 
So I might see this more in, you know, some rural Midwest areas or some, you know, mid-major cities where, where maybe it's not as, as, as lucrative for many people to apply to jobs because they might be able to fill their neurology jobs or their oncology jobs, you know, within six months or eight months of opening them. So we see it vary from geographical um, reach and then also from the type of position, not academics, rarely private practice, unless there's a hospital layover, or maybe unless there's like a, like a, like a history with the group. Sometimes we've seen, you know, maybe a private practice and there's you know, a history with the physician in the community. So, you know, they, maybe they grew up in a community of a hundred thousand or 250,000 in the Midwest and they want to go back there and they know everyone in the practice, that might be an, an instance where there might be a private practice that would uh, provide some kind of plan like this. But most often it's hospital employed position. Now, like you said, sometimes after you sign a stipend, situations change. What are some scenarios that physicians may face if they want to get out of a stipend plan? Yeah, again, how it's repaid, how it's taxed are super important. So most often, if you decide that you don't want to show up for the position, you would owe whatever it is you've taken. So if it's 4000 per month, there might be interest on that. Depending on how they tax it, there might be additional dollars to re repay on that. That might be due within 30 days or 60 days of your notice that you won't show up or when you don't show up, or maybe there'll be some type of payment plan. It depends on how the agreement is worded. So, you know, if you just change your mind, you know, which is okay, you know, there might be, there might be consequences as far as financial repayment to go there. Um, one thing we would we would suggest to that physician who contacted us saying, oh my gosh, I got to pay back $80,000 or $40,000, what do I do? We would say, well, depending on your situation and your negotiating capital, maybe that's something that you can get from your next employer. Or maybe you take a lower salary at your next employer and they pay it off for you. So maybe there's a tax benefit to that. We would encourage them to you know, consult with the, with the, a tax accountant in uh, in that situation but there might be some creative ways to lessen the the the, the pain of, of writing a, a check that large if maybe the physician doesn't have it um other things to consider of course are the unknowns right we talked earlier about death or about disability mm -hmm. the hospital could close for crying out loud you know what happens in those situations maybe the location that you were scheduled to work at is no longer maybe it's a, it's a brand new building it's a wonderful location but maybe it's less than ideal for where you wanted to live mm -hmm. and wanted to work and we could go on and on. There's lots of different situations that are just completely out of the physician's hand. And, and again, it, it's, it, they're out of most all physicians' hands. But when you're signing with a start date in four months or in five months or in 10 months, it might be a little bit less likely to, to change before you get there than if you're signing out you know, a year or two or more. And what kind of ballpark ranges have you seen stipends planned range dollar-wise? You mentioned $4,000 yeah, in this uh, yeah, particular and, instance. What kind of range? Anywhere from a thousand to five thousand is what we've seen, okay. you know. So again, it, that's on a per month basis, and it depends on when it's starting. Maybe it started twelve months before, or eighteen months before, or six months before, and that's for people who are signing out quite a ways. We have seen people who have signed in December and they're starting in July or August, and they're able to get a stipend plan for five months or for six months. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that you can request. Oftentimes, you know, somebody. I mean, our our business typically gets fairly busy in the October, November, December through March and April slows a little bit. And then May, June are a little bit lighter outside of some last minute physician signings. And then of course, we're working with prior clients as well. But depending on when you sign, it might be looked at as more of an advance on your salary, or maybe you're taking your signing bonus early. So maybe they're offering a $50,000 signing bonus, but most of the time we're now seeing signing bonuses paid on commencement. So it's more of a starting bonus, not mm -hmm. a true signing bonus. So maybe the physician says, I don't want a starting bonus. I'd rather have it paid over the next five months so I can you know, pay some loans or pay some bills or save up money for a house. And so there might be some creative ways that you could take what's a signing bonus or a starting bonus and allocate that differently over the course of the next two, six or 10, or 10 months. And that leads me to my next question. If a physician is negotiating for a job that starts sometime in, in the future, they can introduce the potential of a stipend if that fits their best interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think employers are, they know the, the, the intentions of a signing bonus and a lot of them again have shifted it to a commencement bonus, but they're, they all know about stipend plans, I'm assuming. And it would be something that a physician could definitely bring up if they feel that that's best for their individual situation. And we would encourage a open conversation about all types of compensation from, you know, from, from, I mean, any, any pre pre-starting incentives like signing bonuses, stipends, or upfront student loan payments to after you've started working your salary or signing 
or your starting bonus, any student loans that are coming in after you start, or even bonus structures, or even CME dollars, you know, or medical director payments. I mean, lots of different things to be encouraged, open and, and, and good dialogues with the potential employer. We're talking to John Apino. He's the CEO of Contract Diagnostics. Today's Kevin MD article is Navigating Stipend Offers, a Resident's Question. John, as always, we'll end with some take-home messages to the Kevin MD audience. Take all messages. Oh my goodness. I would say when it comes, if we want to keep on this theme of stipends, I would say get a lot of practice interviewing. Interviewing is something that a lot of physicians don't do often. And so things that we don't typically do often, we're not generally good at. And so I think getting some practice interviews, interviewing multiple times, getting multiple offers, I think is a very healthy thing for a physician to do one, just to be good at something that they don't do often. And two, to understand a specific market and the dynamics and how different places compensate. It is good to have competing offers when you're going in and negotiating. It improves your negotiating capital, even if you're a highly sought after specialist or physician. And I think then when you get that letter of intent, don't sign it, have it looked at, negotiate from the letter of intent. If you see a letter of intent, we see, I don't know, one in five uh, physicians have letter of intents. And unfortunately, too many sign them thinking they're non-binding when they're kind of agreeing to the compensation on them. So don't sign those letter of intents, uh, make sure you negotiate from them. And then, of course, when you get your contract, it's important to have everything looked at because there might be some language in there that could be painful from a financial perspective later in the future. And it's important to have some eyes on that of somebody who knows what they're doing. And that's what we do every day here at Contract Diagnostics. We make it, believe it or not, fun for the physician. So a couple of take-home messages there and I look forward to connecting with you soon. John, as always, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. Thanks again for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me.